Welcome to The Spiritual Masters, a podcast from Tan Books and Tan Direction, in which we look at the greatest and holiest writers from Catholic history. Join us as we explore the life and times in which they lived, an overview and study of their greatest works, and how we as Catholics can look to these masters as models for our own holiness on our journey to heaven. Well, welcome back, Father Robert Nixon. Thank you for being here. We're talking today about Bonaventure, the great seraphic doctor. And last episode, we we went through his biography, and and today we are we are jumping into an amazing work that you have translated, and and it's a real gift to the church because the seven last words. Uh, of Christ is, is a work by Bonaventure that has been lost to the ages. It has, it has. So we're going to go through each of the words and go through it so that our, our listeners get a good idea of what this work's all about. But let's begin, as we always do, with a qu- quick prayer invoking the intercession of St. Bonaventure. O oh Lord, you sent your only begotten Son into this world to suffer and die for our sins and to teach us the way to heaven. He offered us his final and definitive lesson on the, on the cross on which he made that great sacrifice. We ask through the intercession of St. Bonaventure that we may listen with reverence and contemplate with true ardour these seven last words of your Son. We ask this through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Now, Seven last words. There have been many works throughout history. Everybody from Fulton Sheen to you know others have have written on the yeah. seven last words of Christ. But it's my understanding that you might have uncovered the very first composition of the seven last words of Christ. Yeah, yeah, and it's actually very interesting because if you read any one of the Gospels, you'll find that it is. And I should say, when we say words, it's not individual words, but it's it's sentences, right. utterances that if you read any given gospel, you won't find that there are seven. There will be different numbers. But if you read all of the gospels together, you will find seven. And um, in in church, uh, in our our Catholic tradition, going back to the Jewish tradition, the number seven is particularly important. It's a number which represents perfection, completion, consummation. Um, So we find, for example, the seven sorrows of Mary, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, the um, seven. Well, I can't think of another There's one. But there, more. There's there are, more. There are yeah. definitely seven sacraments. Seven sacraments, yeah. of course. Um, so, so the and seven. In fact, seven. Uh, Augustine says that there's seven beatitudes, and the eighth one is the summation of the other seven. Yeah. Some people say eight beatitudes. He said there's seven plus a combination plus, plus of all. So, one. seven's a sacred number. It is very much so. And so now, this concept of the seven last words of Christ um, came to public attention, or, or came to be popularly known, because of a certain poem which Saint Bonaventure wrote. Um, basically called the seven last words of Christ, the seven words of Christ upon the cross. Mm. Now, um, I did a little investigation as to where Bonaventure had got this concept of seven words from, and there was a a much earlier writer, uh, a 10th century uh, Benedictine abbot, um, Arnold of Bonneval, who wrote a tract on the seven last words of Christ. Mm. And this seems to have been the first origin of, of, of thinking of these as seven words. Um, there's also a certain prayer attributed to the Venerable Bede called on the seven last words of Christ, but we're not quite sure if Bede really wrote that or if it was a later author. But certainly um, Bonaventure's writing reflects the fact that he had read this work by Arnold of Bonneval, and he used that as his starting point for his own work. Hmm. So in this volume, you have done what with these two works? So what I have done is I have combined Bonaventure's writings, both in his poem, as well as in his other scriptural commentaries and some of his other writings, like The Mystical Vine, um, with the commentary uh, by Arnold of Bonneval. So this work is uh, kind of bringing together of these different, different reflections upon the seven last words. So the principal author is is Bonaventure, 
but the works of Arnold, which formed his his kind of conceptual framework, are in there as well. Yeah, it, it flows beautifully and uh, it all comes together. Today, we're going to kind of focus on Bonaventure's portion of this because he's our spiritual master for today. Indeed. Um, but let's, let's – now this – you um, – Let's get into the first word. Now, the first word or first sentence is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, when we talk about this, um, I'm going to read the, the, the very first kind of few sentences from Bonaventure on this because I want to talk about the uh, the mystical vine, that he, he, he likens this as he goes through to the mystical vine. He says, quote, there are seven words or pronouncements which Christ uttered whilst elevated upon the cross which may be likened to seven rich and verdant leaves springing forth upon a mystical vine. And you inserted the cross itself being the spiritual vine. Again, the wood of the cross may be likened to the frame of a, ly a lyre, and these seven words imagined to be the seven strings extended upon it. It's a beautiful image. So talk to us about he Bonaventure chooses this mystical vine springing yeah. forth from the cross. Um, if I understand that right, tell us about Tell us about that imagery that he adopts throughout this entire work. Yes, yes. So this is is something which he refers to, um, the idea of the cross as this mystical vine, and um, that from it are springing forth these these seven flowers or seven fruits. And I think this is particularly rich because the cross is, uh, on the one hand, it's both a tree of death, but... But for Bonaventure, it became this wonderful tree of glorious new life. Yeah. And these seven pronouncements uh, which take place from the cross, which pour forth from the cross, um, embody the whole of the gospel. And that was the idea that, that in, in his last, um, in his this, the seven last words of the cross were like the, the final testimony of of Jesus to the world. I'm, I forgot to ask that earlier in kind of the introductory remarks. That That's the coolest thing about this is – the seven last words of Christ are seen as a summation of all the gospel. They are. And that, that's an amazing thing. You encapsulate all the things that Christ talked about for three years yeah. in on the cross. Very much. And I mean, the, the Father forgive them for they know not what they do. It exemplifies to us both this quality of mercy and forgiveness, which was so important in Christ's teaching. If someone hits you on one cheek, turn the other. How many times must I forgive the person who offends me? Not <laughs> seven, but seven times seven. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a, is a repeated theme. So it reminds us of that. It also reminds us. Blessed are the, are the merciful. Indeed. As well as um, asking us to be merciful ourselves, it, it reminds us of the mercy of God, that God is prepared to forgive each one of us because in a certain sense, each one of us don't know fully what we're doing. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful passage here. He says, O oh, reader, and I love it when these saints talk to us. O oh, reader, treasure this precious leaf zealously within the depths of your heart. Then whenever you're afflicted by any enemy, you'll be able to summon to your mind the memory of the abundant sweetness of the supremely merciful Jesus. You'll be able to use this saying as a powerful shield against any insults which may be directed against you and any aspersions cast upon you. The divine spouse prayed for those who killed him. Will you not pray for those who insult and criticize you? So as Bonaventure, our spiritual master, telling us, hey, look, you should be able to forgive people who you know do these little insults against you when Christ could forgive the very people who were crucifying him. Yes, that's very true, you know, and you, you think about the horrendous pain which Christ suffered and the horrendous injustice of it all. And we so often get offended at the slightest things and the slightest you know, are, not, thing. are not ready to forgive others. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> the the second word, I'm flipping to it, is page 33. And it is, amen, I say to thee, to, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So we have this incredible moment of the good thief. So why don't you just tell, I mean, our yeah. readers probably know the basics, but why don't you just you know, yeah. encapsulate that, that scene from the gospel. So, so this is a, a scene which we encounter only in the gospel of Luke, interestingly enough, of the repentant thief, who according to tradition is is known as St. Dismas. Dismas, yeah. And um, this thief um, reprimands the one who is mocking him 
And he says, have you no fear of God, seeing that thou art under the same condemnation, and we are condemned justly? And Jesus replies to him, um, I will tell you, I tell you that this day you will be with me in paradise. So this promise of heaven given to this last minute repentance and you know, I know in one of our earlier programs, Connor, we said you can't fully trust in last minute repentance, but this was very different because his repentance was done in the throes of agony and it was accompanied by, you know, this heroic act of defending Jesus um, against those who were mocking him. Yeah. yeah, and turning towards him completely saying, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This was a, a statement of complete faith and surrender. One of the things that amazes me about that event in the Gospels, Father, I thought a lot about this. So here you are dying on the cross, you're in agony. And then Jesus kind of really shocks you and says that you'll be with me in paradise today. Now, he was promised heaven and he knew it and he believed it. If he had an option to get down from the cross and go about living his life, he wouldn't have taken it. No. He was ready to go at that point. So, I mean, the the happiest moments – I mean, who else do we know that Jesus looked at him and said, you're going to be in paradise with me today? Only this guy. He yeah. didn't – I mean, we don't even he, – he, we don't even know if he said that to other people, you know? So, this guy, St. Dismas, he was in agony. But you know, in a sense, he was the most satisfied and the most happy – the most fulfilled person in those in last, those few, moments. last and, few moments. Yeah. yeah. And so it shows us, Father, that like our deep sense of peace and serenity and happiness have nothing to do with how our body is feeling at the moment. Yeah. Isn't that an interesting thought? It, it is. It is. It is. And, and to think that he was in this agony, that he was able to turn away from himself and to look at, at Jesus and in doing that to find this consolation. You know, and, and it's, I think it's a wonderful lesson to each one of us. Whatever situation we're in, we just need to look at Jesus, say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And I, an emphasis, I've heard, you know, I've heard the line, you know, what he said to St. Dismas a thousand times, but Bonaventure emphasizes the, the personal aspect of this. And I'm reading from Bonaventure. Jesus says, thou shalt be with me, italics. Yeah. Not just that he will be in paradise or that he will be in paradise with the angels, but in paradise in the company of the one whom he recognizes as his Savior. Neither does Christ defer what he offers, but promises it that it will be today. Our Lord is quick to hear, quick to promise, and quick to give. Who should despair when there is such a ready listener who is unhesitating in his promises and so quick to fulfill what he pledges? I mean, I see Bonaventure here just you know, just jumping for joy at the personal nature of Jesus Christ and how he's how he's uh, very quick to give and quick to forgive and quick to promise. Yeah, that that he is always ready to hear the, these pleas of repentance whenever and where wherever they happen yeah. and respond immediately. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a beautiful sentiment. The third word, I'll just keep on moving through. Um, page 47, <clears throat> the third word. Uh, and maybe my favorite, woman, behold thy son. And then he says to John, behold thy mother. What do you have to say about this one? Yeah, the, these words are uh, the most touching and profound, I think, in the whole of John's passion narrative. We see that Jesus, even though he was in agony himself, in physical agony, um, looked down with infinite love upon his blessed mother and upon the beloved disciple John. And this beloved disciple John actually represents not only uh, the apostle himself, but every faithful Christian disciple. So we see in this Jesus is making his mother into our mother. And I think this is, this is a wonderful thing, um, that she is with us all the time with an with a ear of maternal compassion. And Jesus is looking uh, down upon us and telling us to to venerate her as our very own mother. So this is a very beautiful and touching thing. I, again, I see I see the man of Bonaventure, our spiritual master, kind of coming through the page here. And on page 48, at the bottom of page 48, he says, I imagine Mary to have stood with her head covered, 
how often she must have cried out as she wept, Jesus, my son, who will grant me that I may die in place of you, my son, or that I may now meet my own death with you. How many times must she have raised her tear-filled eyes to his bleeding wounds and again turned them away, overcome by sheer horror and grief? I marvel that she herself did not succumb to death. So great were the waves of anguish which engulfed her. I mean, this is Bonaventure, you know, really using his imagination, not just as like some kind of boring theologian, but almost like a poet and artist, uh, yeah. somebody with a great imagination, placing himself in, in, in the place of Mary and saying, what was she going through? And he seems to really tap into what Mary must have been feeling at the foot of the cross. Yes, Bonaventure had this uh, immense love for the Blessed Virgin, and this comes through so powerfully here. And he's able, I think, to, to share in this great compassion with her, you know, and this is one of the one of the principal characteristics of the early Franciscan spirituality: the strong identification with with the crucified Christ and with the suffering Mother. Came through, in, of course, in the stigmata on Saint Francis of Assisi himself, and this was uh, was was something which was part of the living reality for the Franciscans. Yeah, yeah. On page 59, and by the way, for our listeners, just so you know, we're, we're looking at manuscripts. This book hasn't come out yet, so it's our it's our page 59. It's not going to be their page 59, most likely, Indeed. you know, after a book is typeset. The pagination is different. But just so we're on the same page, <clears throat> 59, we go on to the fourth word of Christ. Oh, yes. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And every year in the Passion at, at the Liturgy, we hear the priest say, uh, what, how do you say it? Eli, Eli, Lava Sabachthani, you know, yeah. something like that, you know? And so we always hear them role play that in the liturgy and it's beautiful, but, um, it's, and this is perhaps the most confusing. It is, it of is. the words and, on the cross. And, and it's something which, you know, as a priest, I'm very frequently asked about people say, you know, why did he say that? Was he really abandoned? Surely he knew that he wasn't abandoned. And he talks about this. Um, and he explains, Bonaventure offers this wonderful explanation. So he shows himself united with the suffering church in doing this because um, the church is the body of Christ and Christ himself as the head, of course, was God himself. So couldn't be abandoned by God. But at the same time, he is in full union with all the suffering uh, of the members of the church, of every individual uh, Catholic, every individual Christian. And so often people feel themselves abandoned by God. Um, and so so this question is uttered um, as the voice of the suffering multitude. So it's an outpouring, not only for his own agony, but for the agony of, of all broken hearts, all crushed spirits throughout the world. It's really a, a almost a divine sense of empathy. It is, us. it is, it is, yeah. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And, and of course, there's this paradox that God, Jesus himself is God, so how could he be abandoned by God? But there is also this interpretation that he is abandoning the my part of it. So uh, he is abandoning the self, the human self, to immerse himself, to be united mystically with with the entire suffering of the world and, and with the divine infinity of God who is beyond any self. Well, I didn't bring this up before in the, in the part on Mary, the previous word, but I read somewhere else, and I don't know if this is true, but I found it to be a, a beautiful insight. Perhaps when he, when he said, woman, behold thy son, and son, behold thy mother, here are these people who are at the foot of the cross supporting him, and that might have been a little metaphorical way of he's detached from his physical health, he's yeah. been detached from everything, and here he is voluntarily giving up even his mother and even his uh, beloved disciple. It's like the very last thing that he has to give yeah. and he gives his mother away. The, yeah, the, the very the very last and the very most precious, most precious. thing he has. And so then, you know, when he says, why hast thou forsaken me? He's saying that a time when he's got nothing left. He's given yeah. everything, including those who loved him. Yeah. Yeah. So this complete self-emptying. Yeah. 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 That's a kind of a beautiful notion. I mean, even religious life, you know, you, you have to leave your family. You have to kind of give up your parents and your siblings. You know what I mean? Well, well, well you do. I mean, there's this, this element of detachment. 
even though you you know it's important still to maintain contact with them and everything but but there is also at a deeper level this necessi- necessity of of detachment of self emptying not only for religious life though i think but for all christians you know in family life as well there's this sacrifice of of self this surrender to the will of god yeah yeah, yeah. The next word, the, the fifth word, um, page 70, uh, I thirst, I thirst. And yeah, he must have been thirsty at this point. He definitely wanted some water, but it goes beyond that. Yes. So what do you think he meant? What does Bonaventure say yeah. he really meant when he says, I thirst? Um, so this is, yeah, a very dramatic point when he talks about it and he concludes his reflection with some very important, um, I think, a very important insight. Um, As your muscles trembled and your strength waned, then a burning thirst overwhelmed you. This was a thirst born of pure love, a fervent desire for our salvation. With infinite kindness, then, did you say, I thirst? Yes, I thirst for the faith of humankind. I long for their salvation. And it is for this reason alone that I suffer now as I do. Yeah, so this thirst is is expressing this kind of infinite desire, this desire and what's it for? It's not just for physical drink, but a desire for the salvation of, of every soul there is. You know, Mother Teresa had up put in all of the chapels, you know, all the houses that she had for her nuns, a, a crucifix, but then right next to it, I thirst. Yeah. And I think the reason she did that was to remind us of the those who they were there to serve. Everyone's yeah. thirsting. But Christ is is thirsting on their behalf, but most importantly, he's thirsting for our own conversion. And so I don't know there's a m- multiple layers to that simple yeah, last there, word. There, there is. And, and I, I think, as you said, to see the hunger and the thirst of Christ in the hunger and thirst of our fellow human beings, that whenever someone calls upon us for help, it's actually Christ who's calling upon us for help. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a yeah. So we we are we are both the ones who are thirsting ourselves in union with Him, and we're the ones who are fulfilling that thirst. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. The sixth word on page eighty-one. It is consummated. Now we talked about this slightly, you know, in another discussion that we had, but the the point I will mention is that. Uh, the Dewey Reams translation, which is Tan's preferred translation, uses the word "it is consummated," whereas other translations, RSV, NAB, they say it is finished or it's it's over, or it's ended. Yeah, um, it's a very different connotation to say it is finished versus it is consummated. So, actually, Bonaventure expresses pretty fully what consummation here means. He does. He does. And yeah, this consummation means um, this bringing something to perfection, to completion, to fulfillment. And he writes, um, as to its significance, it seems straightforward, yet it contains an immense and unfathomable magnitude of mystical meaning and is replete with very profound and transcendent mysteries. Since it describes a consummation or completion, it is fitting that the words themselves should be brief and simple. Thus it was, in the perfect and life-giving sacrifice of the Son of God, all the ancient sacrifices and rites of the Old Covenant are brought to their single completion. Mm -hmm. This consummation encompasses the perfection of all the deeds of the patriarchs, all the offerings of the law, all the oracles of the prophets, and all the mystical arcana of the scriptures. So this is bringing to fulfillment all the promises of God. And, uh, you know, I think... The idea of consummation in relation to marriage is very important here because this is the consummation of the mystical humanity, of the mystical union with divinity and humanity. So when I think of consummation of a marriage, I'm thinking about actually a beginning, like something yeah. that's beginning. It is. And and so this, it's, to say it is finished, it's so imperfect because it, yeah. this is not, yes, this the Old Testament has been fulfilled – but the New Testament has just gotten going, the New Covenant. Indeed, indeed. And that's something which Bonaventure talks about. He says, witness how exultantly Christ exclaims these words. He cries out like the navigator of a ship which has been on an ocean for a long voyage. 
who, when he first catches a glimpse of the shore, shouts, Land, Land ahoy. ahoy. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's like he has achieved what he said. He's achieved his mission, yeah. the salvation of the world. So, yeah. It's, it's it, a beautiful notion, you know. Yes, yes, which is so much better than it is ended or yeah. it is finished. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It is, it, it's, it's just begun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the seventh word, the final word on page 90, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And uh, yes. um, this is beautiful. I'll just, uh, I'm going to read just the first paragraph. It says, it is noteworthy that of the seven pronouncements made by our Lord Jesus Christ as he approached his death, the gospel texts say that, that three of these were said in a great voice. The first was when he said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? The second was, it is consummate. And the third occasion was when he said his very last words, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It's just interesting that Bonaventure's Zoning in here that he said it in a great voice. He essentially yelled it from yeah. the cross. Yeah. His very last thing he said, yeah. he bellowed out for whole, all the world to hear. In, indeed. And, you know, you might think, well, this what is is like a personal prayer. So why would he say this one in a loud voice? But uh, Bonaventure gives this very um, great explanation. He's saying that it, it clearly reveals his divinity. So... He's saying that most people, when they're about to die, they can barely utter any words, and the mm -hmm. words they say are, are whispered or, or barely audible. But Christ here displays his divinity by showing that he's still capable of crying out in this great voice. Yeah. And, you know, this is perhaps something which, um, which I, until I read this, hadn't really thought about, you know, what was Christ like actually at the moment of death. And Bonaventure is saying he's showing that he still possesses this this strength, this omnipotence of divinity, even though he is dying. Yeah, he voluntarily dies. Yeah, you know, I mean, he could yeah. he could have overcome it that moment well, if he, he could, wanted to. He could, he could. And so he says, "I love this." He says, "Just as a victorious warrior cries out when he has conquered his foes or put them to flight, even so did Jesus cry out strongly when he had defeated death and sin." I mean, that's a victorious warrior. Yeah, right there hanging on the cross as the sacrificial lamb. That's that's a powerful concept. This is this is it's magnificent. You know what? I, and uh, as I said, Connor, I hadn't imagined it in that way ever before. But, Me neither. But but it really does shed a great light upon this. You know that it, this commending his spirit into the hands of his father um, isn't isn't just a, a surrender. This is a cry of victory. You know, he he's he's finished his mission, as he said in the consumatum est, and now. Um, He's just making his journey homeward. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. powerful. What an amazing book. Thank you for translating this. I mean, this was a great find. And then you had to artistically put these together with um, the other work in, in the book to kind of give it a, a full completion. And it, it's uh, it's you've done a tremendous service to give us access to something that's never been in English before. I mean, this is a resurrection of an incredible work by – the seraphic doctor, a great spiritual master. So what a what a wonderful gift. Thank you very much for your work here. Thanks so much, Connor. And it's, you know, a great pleasure for me, um, a great thrill that Ted is working to bring these uh, treasures, to resurrect these great treasures for the reading public today. Well, in our next episode, we're going to um, kind of wrap up Bonaventure and talk about what he has to offer us in our own spiritual journey each day we live on this earth and how to seek his intercession and become more like him so um until then thank you and god bless father for being here thank you connor god bless this has been an episode of the spiritual masters a podcast brought to you by tan to follow the show learn about more inspiring holy men and women and to support the spiritual masters and other great free content from tan Visit spiritualmasterspodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code MASTERS25 to get 25% off your next order, including works by St. Bonaventure and countless more spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. And thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.